Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast, hope you're all alright. So this time it's a first over here at History in 20, we are talking about some American history, which I am a fan of, but it's not nowhere near one of my specialities or anything, I'm a big, big fan of it, so I thought, well, why not do something on it? So the starting point is today's episode, which is Pearl Harbor, better known as the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which... You might have heard of because it was the main event which brought the USA into the Second World War. So, very short overview of it. It happened on the 7th of December 1941, so almost exactly 79 years ago. Um, belligerents were, of course, the USA and Japan. Um, and casualty wise, there were, uh, well, 2043 sailors, soldiers, and civilians were killed and approximately a further 1,000 were injured. Uh, as for like battleships and stuff, there was four battleships that were sunk, four battleships were damaged, 29 aircraft were destroyed, and 74 aircraft were damaged. So, as ever, we look at the background of these things. So, where is a good starting point for Pearl Harbor? Well, if you remember in my last episode about the gunpowder plot, it was, again, it was one day's worth of stuff that was the event, and we just looked a few months back, or maybe a year back, this time, I'm going to go a bit further back. I'm going 10 years before Pearl Harbor. Why are we going 10 years back? Well, hopefully it makes sense from here. So I'm going 10 years back to the Manchurian Crisis of 1931, which I think I did about in my GCSE history, so that was the last time I heard about that. But I had to do a bit more research on it for this one, so here's a little bit on that. So the Manchurian Crisis was basically Japan invaded Manchuria, which is a province in China, as you should be able to see on your screen now. And they'd implemented some dynamite along a Chinese railway, which in turn blew up a Japanese train. Now it was made to look as if the Chinese had done this on purpose to blow up a Japanese train. And it made it look as if they'd done this so that the Japanese had a reason to invade. So obviously Japan did invade with little hesitation and then they established the puppet state of Manchukuo. Now, over the next decade, Japan continued invading areas of China and a Japanese attack on the USS Panay, which was a battleship, on the 12th of December 1937 helped to further turn Western opinion against the Japanese. But how did this invasion of an area of China, even before the attack on the USS Panay, spark American interest in Japan and China? Now, America was particularly dissatisfied and unhappy with Japan's increasingly belligerent attitude towards China. Now, the Japanese government believed that the only way to solve its economic and demographic problems it was experiencing was to expand into China's territory and take over its import market. Now, eventually, Japan declared war on China in 1937. So, in response to this the US imposed a number of economic sanctions and trade embargoes on Japan, which only made Japan more determined to stand their ground. Now, during these months of negotiations between both Tokyo and Washington DC, neither side would budge at all, which made war seem almost inevitable. So, fearing a Japanese invasion because of these sort of stubborn attitudes and their belligerence towards China, the US, the UK and France all assisted China with its loans for war supply contracts, further aggravating the Japanese that all these Western powers are going against the Japanese and what the Japanese view as their right to these things. But uh, So come mid-1940, the US president, who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, also known as FDR, he moved the Pacific Fleet from San Diego, California to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Now, we also ordered a military build-up in the Philippines too, and this was an attempt to discourage Japanese aggression in the Far East. Um, so we'll fast forward a year from there. So by July 1941, the US had frozen Japanese assets in the, U in the US following the seizure of French Indochina after the fall of France. Um, you'll sh I'll put up a map of that on your screen so you might be able to see that because it's quite hard to explain really. Um, which thereby like thereby imposing a virtual embargo on all trade, including oil. Now, this step made it just about certain that Japan would have to seize oil fields to fulfil its strategic needs, while also ejecting the US from the Asian theatre to stop the US's interference. So, come the 17th of August 1941, President Roosevelt warned Japan that America was prepared to take opposing steps if neighbouring countries i.e. China, were attacked. 
So Japan was now faced with a dilemma. They either withdraw from China and lose face, and obviously Japanese pride was a big thing then, still is, um, or they seize new resources of raw materials in the resource-rich European colonies of Southeast Asia. Now, because the Japanese high command was mistakenly certain that any attack on Europe's Southeast Asian colonies, including Singapore, would bring the US into the war, a devastating preventive strike appeared to be the only way to prevent American naval interference. And that is why they decided to attack Pearl Harbor. So the attack itself, we'll talk a little bit just before we get into that. So where is Pearl Harbor? Well, Pearl Harbor is in Hawaii and it's situated about 2,000 miles from the US mainland and about 4,000 miles from Japan. And that is exactly the problem, because nobody thought or expected that Japan would start a war with an attack on the distant islands of Hawaii, practically in the middle of the North Pacific and these small, small set of islands that belong to the US, uh, right in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, why would Japan attack there? So because of this thought that Japan would never attack there and start a war from there, American intelligence officials were absolutely confident that any Japanese attack, if it were to take place, would take place in one of the European colonies in the Pacific, which includes the Dutch East Indies, French Indochina, or Singapore. Now, as a result of the American military leaders not expecting an attack so close to home, Pearl Harbor itself was actually left relatively undefended. So almost the entire Pacific fleet that, if we remember earlier, FDR had moved from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, almost the entire Pacific fleet was moored around Ford Island in the harbor. And hundreds of aeroplanes as well were packed onto adjacent airfields. So to Japan, Pearl Harbor was an irresistibly easy target. So Japan's plan was simple. They just had to destroy the entire Pacific fleet. And by doing that, the US would be unable to fight back and then that meant that Japan's armed forces would spread right across Europe's South Pacific colonies, like we mentioned Indochina, the Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Singapore, etc. Uh, that was Japan's plan. Now, after months of tactical planning, Japan launched their attack. So the actual attack, the uh, interesting bit, the bit that hopefully you've all clicked on this video for. So at 7.48 a.m. Hawaii time on Sunday the 7th of December 1941, the skies over Pearl Harbor were filled with Japanese planes and bullets and bombs just rained down onto the vessels below which were moored in the harbor just like sitting ducks. So at 8.10 a.m. an 1,800-pound bomb smashed through the deck of the battleship USS Arizona and landed in its forward ammunition magazine and the ship obviously exploded upon impact immediately and it sank with more than 1,000 American men trapped inside. And then torpedoes also pierced the body of the USS Oklahoma and that rolled onto its side sinking with a further 400 Americans on board. Now remarkably, this devastating surprise attack actually lasted less than two hours and every single battleship in Pearl Harbor, and I will list them because there's only a few, the USS Arizona, the USS Oklahoma, USS California, USS Maryland, USS Nevada, USS Pennsylvania, USS Tennessee, USS Utah, and USS West Virginia, if you've guessed they're all named after US states. So every single one of those ships had sustained significant damage, and all of them but the USS Arizona and USS Utah were eventually salvaged and repaired. So what sort of impact did this attack have? So the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor crippled almost 20 American ships and over 300 aeroplanes. Airfields were likewise destroyed in the statistics I mentioned earlier. I'll just reiterate those once more. 2,043 soldiers, sailors and civilians were killed, along with a 1,000 more injured. And if we remember just before, of those 2,043, there was over a 1,000 of them were on the USS Arizona. But thankfully, from an American point of view, Japan had failed to destroy the Pacific fleet. Because by the 1940s, battleships were no longer the most important naval vessels in war. Aircraft carriers were. And as it actually happened, all of the Pacific Fleet's aircraft carriers were away from Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, as some had returned to the mainland USA and others were delivering planes to troops stationed on Midway and the Wake Islands, which we'll mention in a little bit. Now, additionally, the attack on Pearl Harbor left the base's most important onshore facilities undamaged, 
remarkably, including oil storage depots, submarine docks, shipyards and repair shops. So as a result, the US Navy was actually able to rebound fairly quickly from the attack. So what sort of responses did we have to this attack then? Well, we'll start in the UK with uh, the then Prime Minister Winston Churchill. So uh, the US amb ambassador to the UK was a guy called John G. Winant. And he was having dinner with the Prime Minister of the UK, Winston Churchill, when they heard of the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Because I think 7.48 Hawaiian time is 18.18, so 6.18 p.m. UK time. So it would have been presumably the 7 o'clock news or round about then that they'd have heard this news. So, uh, yeah, John G. Winant, the US ambassador, was having dinner with Churchill when they heard this news. And Winant recalled Churchill's excitement at hearing the news. And he said, Churchill jumped to his feet and started for the door with the announcement, we shall declare war on Japan. And when Roosevelt phoned up Churchill, his first words to his UK counterpart were, we're all in the same boat now. So I think Roosevelt knew as well <coughs> that America were due to enter the war. So speaking of Roosevelt, he addressed a joint session of the US Congress on Monday the 8th of December 1941, a day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And he used one of the most widely remembered lines in US history when he referred to the attackers yesterday, December 7th, 1941. And he said this line that is remembered and quoted in films all over the place, a date that will live in infamy. He said, a date that will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. And he added that he will make very certain that this form of treachery shall never endanger us again. And for the first time during the years of negotiations with Japan throughout the 1930s, the American people were united in their determination to go to war. So Japan's aim from the attack was, rather naively looking at it now, was to goad the US into dropping the economic sanctions they'd placed against them, but instead they'd pushed America into a global conflict that ultimately resulted in Japan's first occupation by a foreign power. And later in the day, on the 8th of December as well, Congress approved Roosevelt's declaration of war on Japan. And three days later, on the 11th of December 1941, Japan's allies, Germany and Italy, declared war against the US. So for the second time in three days, Congress reciprocated, declaring war on both Germany and Italy as well. So more than two years after the start of the Second World War, the US had entered the conflict. So what is the legacy of Pearl Harbor then? So the legacy of Pearl Harbor and the Pearl Harbor attack was, of course, bringing the US into the Second World War. So quite obviously, the European powers would not have won the war without the assistance of the US. But, as ever, I'm not going to be jingoistic about this or, like, you know, anglocentric or anything like that. I want to look at it from all points of view because I think that's the fairest way we can get an assessment about this. And there were some negative sides which I wanted to shine a light on, which you don't often hear, uh, unfortunately. So the main thing I'm talking about here is, of course, the internment camps. So the attack on Pearl Harbor through the US Pacific coast and especially California as that's the nearest state to Hawaii into a mass panic with California being deemed as the next location for a Japanese attack. So the Japanese advance across Burma, Malaya and the Philippines not only present a threat to the European colonies, which we could also argue is one of the problems with colonization, but that's completely different and I won't get into that today. But it also presents a threat to Australia, who are always deemed as the Western power in the south in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it was rumoured that this it was this rumoured invasion scare, which ultimately led to the mass arrest and internment of Americans of Japanese ancestry across the U.S., but particularly centred in California. Now, on the same day as the attack, the seventh of December, the FBI. Uh, who were assisted with the help of sheriff's deputies, began rounding up suspected Japanese aliens in Los Angeles County. So by the 9th of December 1941, which was a mere two days after the attack, uh, about 500 Isai, which are Japanese non-citizens, were in federal custody on Terminal Island in Los Angeles Harbour. Um, and then we'll fast forward a couple of months to the 19th of February 1942. President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which allowed the War Department to remove suspicious or possibly dangerous people, which in their view were Japanese people, from military areas. And they end up going in internment camps, which isn't too dissimilar to the sort of concentration camps that we 
we associate with the war in Europe and in Germany and even in Burma and stuff, we associate that. We don't often think of America getting involved in that, but unfortunately that was one of the negative legacies of this attack. Now, this incarceration was later, obviously thankfully and rightly so, deemed to be illegal and racially discriminatory. Uh, however, America did regain the military initiative in the naval war in the Pacific, which had obviously been sparked by Pearl Harbor in the Battles of Coral Sea, which was May 1942, and the Battle of Midway in June 1942. And they then began the long series of island hopping campaigns to reconquer Japanese held territory in the South and Central Pacific. Now, ultimately, the US would go on to formally end the Second World War in Japan itself with, of course, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima on the 6th of August and Nagasaki on the 9th of August, 1945. So that's what I've decided and discussed as the legacy of Pearl Harbor, as ever. If you've got any comments, let me know. If you've got any requests, let me know in the section below. Don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Hope you enjoyed that one. See you next time.